my great grandfather came here in probably it was the 1800s. Moved to the Lower East Side, opened a cobbler shop on the Lower East Side, and lived upstairs from that. I'm talking to Joe Geller, 879, at his home in South Norwalk, Connecticut. Joe's great-grandfather, Herman Geller, had originally come from Budapest, Hungary, where the family had an interesting and artistic vocation. They were carousel horse builders. They They would carve and build carousel horses in Hungary. That cobbler shop on the Lower East Side eventually became a well-known women's shoe brand, Andrew Geller Shoes. In fact, you can still find these high fashion shoes on eBay today. And his oldest son was Andrew. And in those days, if you start a business, it was always named after the eldest child. And the eldest child was Andrew. Andrew Geller Shoes opened its first shoe boutique in Harlem. And in those early years, they had an interesting clientele. They would also design shoes and make shoes for Hollywood people, for Hollywood stars. Zaza Gabor was one of them, I remember. Um, Some of them were even burlesque, for burlesque shows. Eventually, Andrew Geller Shoes opened a factory in Brooklyn. Joe remembers going there as a kid. But I remember as a kid going to the factory, my dad would go in on Saturdays, the four of us would pile into the car and go to the factory. And we would run around on the floors and it was a beautiful old wood factory. McCarran Park was right across the street because this was right at the corner of Bayard and Lorimer. And it was a dirt, just a dirt park. There was nothing there. There was an abandoned swimming pool there. And I remember my dad saying, stay away from there, do not go there. And we would just play baseball or hit it, throw a ball around. But the best part about visiting the factory, remembers Joe, was the food. When we would go in there on Saturdays, the whole neighborhood was Italian. There were little markets. Behind the markets, either the husband or the wife would have a little restaurant in the back. I mean, there were a couple of tables. They would have all this homemade food and you would just go in there and whatever they had, you would eat. And I just remember the food being unbelievably delicious. Joe even got to see how shoes were made, the old fashioned way. But again, it was a primarily Italian neighborhood. People that were in the factory were mostly Italians that were working in the factory. It was not highly automated. I remember they would take shoes and stretch them over the leather and literally nails would be in their mouth and be taking nails out of their mouth to hammer the leather into the form to make the shoes. It was, uh, that was the beginning of it. Later, Andrew Geller Shoes opened a shoe factory in Italy itself, where a well-known designer got his start. Doro Della Valle is Diego Della Valle's father. Diego is the guy who founded Todd's. There was an article in the New Yorker, I don't know, I may still have it, about Andrew Geller and how Doro Della Valle, Diego's dad, really got into making shoes and doing high fashion shoes with Andrew Geller. And I actually met Diego. He came to visit us in Cambridge, he was a young guy He hated the fast food. He said, we're never going to have McDonald's here in Italy. He said, I don't understand all the fast food here. He was not married at the time. He was a young guy coming to to the States. And Mickey and I were living in Cambridge at the time. And we took him around and showed him Boston and Cambridge. His dad, again, his dad was a sweetheart of a man. Really nice guy uh, and very talented. Prior to moving to New York, Joe spent his early years in Boston, where his dad, Bert Geller, worked for an uncle's shoe company, Algae Shoes. Bert had a friend, Joe Stein, who was studying architecture at Harvard, and encouraged Bert to come to one of the lectures. My dad, when we were living in Boston, had a good friend who was studying architecture at Harvard, and told my dad that he should come and hear a couple of lectures by one of his professors, Marcel Breuer. Marcel Breuer was one of the most iconic designers and architects 
of the mid-century modern era. Like Joe's family, Breuer had come from Hungary, leaving his hometown at just 18 to study at the famed Bauhaus School founded by Walter Gropius in Weimar, Germany. Breuer became famous for his furniture designs, and just steps from where we are talking to Joe are several of his amazing pieces on display, featuring his innovative use of tubular metal and bent wood. Breuer later joined Gropius on the faculty at Harvard, but they parted ways in 1946, and Breuer moved to New York and opened up his own architectural firm. One of his first clients were Joe's parents, Bert and Phyllis Geller. Breuer designed a home for the Geller family on Ocean Avenue in Lawrence, New York, one of the five towns on the southern shore of western Long Island. The house was actually completed in 1947. I had three brothers. We lived in what was his first, what they called a binuclear house. Uh, basically, it was the children's area was in one, one section, the living area in another section. But just to give you an idea, the total square footage of that house was 2,300 square feet. Four boys grew up in that house. The house became known as Geller House One, one of Breuer's first solo projects, and today considered a masterpiece of modern residential architecture. But Breuer did not want his homes to be treated like museums. He wanted them to be lived in. Growing up as a kid, my mother was immaculate. We got up in the morning, we had our beds made, we had our books laid out, everything was, just had to be in order. Um, and Breuer, I remember him coming to the house, this is backtracking a little bit, he said, Filky, and that's what he called my mother. My name was Phyllis, he said, Filky, my houses are meant to be lived in. Don't, this looks like when the photographers came when the house was first done, live in it, use it, make it a mess. <laughs> Later, Joe had the opportunity to visit Breuer's own home on Cape Cod, and he got to see that the talented designer practiced what he preached. So when we went to Breuer's house, he had cooked chicken paprikash. The kitchen was a mess. It was lived in. I mean, because I was brought up as a neat freak. I just, the house was just chaotic in my mind, but it was lived in. He had a mural right in the kitchen, sort of on the left side of the kitchen, and it was a mural that was painted, and it says, to Cheska, Cheska was Breuer's daughter, his Breuer's daughter's name is Cheska, love Sandy, from Sandy Calder. I mean, these guys were phenomenal, and it was a fabulous mural that he just painted as a gift for Cheska. Breuer cultivated relationships with many leading artists of the day. After Geller House One was completed in 1947, he suggested to Joe's parents that they go see an innovative new artist on Long Island. Breuer had said to my parents, um, after they had moved into the house in 1947, go out to Long Island, I want you to go look at an artist out there who's doing some interesting work. And my parents went out to Long Island and it was Jackson Pollock. Joe's parents soon headed out to Eastern Long Island to meet this novel new artist. So they went out there and they saw Jackson Pollock's work. Um, uh, my dad liked it, my mother didn't like it. Uh, they decided that they would commission him to do a mural to, that would go on the back of the bookcase that basically there was a bookcase that divided the living room from the dining room and it was a mural that he painted on that and it was one of two commission works that he did. Uh, the other one was for Peggy Guggenheim, and the work was installed back on, on the back of the bookcase. Jackson Pollock's drip paintings took the art world by storm, and a 1949 article in Life magazine asked the question, is this the greatest living painter in the United States? Shortly afterward, however, at the height of his fame, Pollock gave up doing drip paintings, and he died in a car accident in 1956, just 44 years old. One thing that makes Pollock murals so valuable today is how few of them were produced. Joe's dad eventually sold the painting to Bill Rubin, head of the Museum of Modern Art, 
as part of an arrangement to bring more modern art to the Hood Museum at Dartmouth, which was Bert Geller's alma mater. Bert sold it for what seemed like a princely sum at the time, $80,000. Later, Rubin sold the painting to the wife of the Shah of Iran, a prolific collector of modern art. After the 1979 revolution, the painting became property of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and it is rarely seen in public today, although it was shown in Japan in 2012. Joe and Mickey recently visited the Pollock Museum at his home in Long Island. And at the end of the tour, I, I said to the docent, um, could I please go to the office and talk to the person who's in charge of this? And she said, well, her name is Helen Harrison. So I go in to the office and I said, hi, I said, um, I'm Joe Geller. And she said, are you Bert Geller's son? I said, yes. <laughs> she said, she said, uh, she said to me, the mural on Indian red background. I said, yes, I grew up with it. So we spent probably the afternoon talking to her about it. She showed us pictures of the mural and it had been in Japan because Japan has a relationship with Iran. She had actually gone to Japan. She specifically wanted to see pictures of this mural. So it was uh, an interesting afternoon. Joe and Mickey also attended another event where they learned even more about this famous painting. Mickey and I went to see a Pollock retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art and we ended up talking to the curator and I said to the curator, do you know a mural called, uh, a Pollock mural called Mural on Indian Red Background? She said, yes, there's a major Hollywood collector who is trying to buy it from Iran. Pollock drip paintings are today some of the most valuable commodities on the global art market. And the mural that hung in Joe's living area is considered to be one of his best. Christie's has valued the painting at no less than $250 million. But Joe says they had no idea they were living in the shadow of such a masterpiece. It was just something they lived with. My mother was a fanatic about cleaning, and you could see on the bottom of the painting, she vacuumed so hard to get under the bookcase that there was a line. There was a vacuum cleaner line on the bottom <laughs> of it. As kids, we would go and we would pick the paint off of it. <laughs> After graduating from Cornell, Joe Geller began his studies for an MBA at Columbia. But the Vietnam War was on and the specter of being drafted. So Joe volunteered and served in the Air Force Air National Guard, spending most of his time at Air Force bases in Texas. In 1966, Joe married Mickey Fine, and together they embarked on a new venture. So Mickey and I got married, we went to Boston, we opened up our own store called Upper Crust on Newbury Street in Boston. And it was a clothing and shoe store, clothing and a shoe boutique. Uh, Mickey had worked for uh, Mademoiselle Magazine. We got a lot of publicity about the store when the store opened. I have some pictures of uh, Mickey and I like in a tree with s crazy clothes that she was wearing. Uh, I was in an Armani suit, I think. Oh my God, I have a picture of it. Mickey and Joe were always on the lookout for new, innovative designers. We found a lot of interesting designers, and at that time we went down to the Lower East Side. There were young people doing interesting designs with clothing down there. And we bought shoes from Andrew Geller, but again, we would buy the more avant-garde, far out kind of looking shoes. Some of those designers would go on to international fame. The Bessie Johnson connection was, Bessie Johnson was designing for a company called Paraphernalia, again down on the Lower East Side, and we had their clothes in our store. The jewelry designer was Maison de Fou, a Lower East Side company, two women that were doing uh, avant-garde jewelry. Um, and the Albert Alvis was just clothing done with animal skins. In addition to the Lower East Side, Mickey and Joe had great success finding clothing in Europe that was at the time not available in the United States. We actually went 
mini kilts were really popular. I remember Mickey and I had gone to Scotland. We had a designer named Scott 80. They did mini Shetland sweaters and mini kilts. So that's what we do. We just find these interesting yeah. lines of clothes. And also at that time, the dollar was so strong. We went to Paris and we actually bought Yves Saint Laurent, Yves Gauche. We went into their retail store, bought the, that line of clothing just as, as if we were retail customers and brought it back and sold it in our store. Again, because the dollar was so strong. Unfortunately, Upper Crust would become, in some ways, a victim of its own success. With Upper Crust, it was such a popular store that literally one night people broke through a brick wall on the side of the store, stole all the clothing, we contacted the police, uh, we had alarm systems, they didn't go off because they went right through the brick wall. And the stuff was being sold in the south end of Boston, which is today a very fancy area to live. Joe and Mickey decided to move to New York, where Joe planned to take over the Andrew Geller Shoe Boutique on 57th Street. Then I was going to take over the, the running of the store on 57th Street, and I wanted to make radical changes because Henry Bendel was right next door. They were a very high fashion, very young store, and wanted to make major changes to the store, but it was really difficult to do and difficult to work with my father and that gener and my that generation. Joe and Mickey returned to Boston, where they leased the shoe department at the luxury department store Von Witt Teller, effectively running it like their own business. Von Witt Teller was in an historic building on the corner of Berkeley Street, Berkeley and Newbury Street. We had leased the women's shoe department there. It was a beautiful old building. Bonwitz generally would lease the shoe department, jewelry, and furs because they were the most expensive inventories to maintain. Joe and Mickey moved to Cambridge, where they were soon raising their two daughters, Katie and Betsy. It was an eclectic community, they remember, and you would always run into interesting people. We lived in Cambridge. Um, we lived on Farrar Street, which was near Holden Green, which was the Harvard Married Student Housing. Julia Child lived down the street. She would come by our house and loved our dog and would hold, the, touch the dog like a piece of meat. Just loved the dog. She was a terrific lady. She shopped at Savinor's Market, which was right around the corner from us. Among their group of interesting friends was Peter Wolf, headliner for the Jay Giles Band. My blood runs. Yes, that Jay Giles band. Joe remembers running into Peter one day. I remember one day we had a little sob and we were in the square and Peter was walking and we said, oh, come on, we'll give you a ride. He gets in the car, he's all dressed in black, which is Peter, and Betsy is, he gets into the back of the car, Betsy's in a, in a little car seat and starts to scream and cry because <laughs> she was afraid of him. <laughs> Mickey and Joe enjoyed living in Cambridge and raising their two daughters there. It was a special community, Joe remembers. We loved living there because it was, you know, it was sort of it was a progressive community. People were interesting. There were all kinds of people that you would meet uh, in the arts and stuff like that. You know, and just running into Julia Child, walking down the street, loving your dog. I mean, it's just uh, those kinds of things would just would happen. Then we moved over to the other side of Cambridge between Brattle and Euron and Appleton and Sparks. Um, you know, our kids, um, our kids went to school with David Rockefeller's daughter, Neva Kaiser. She lived in a very modest house, had an old beat up Ford. Davy Kaiser and Katie were in, in the same grade together. Just uh, very down to earth people. Uh, Who's the Supreme Court judge now? Um, Stephen Breyer. He went to school with her kids. These were just very down-to-earth, decent people that light chose Cambridge to live because they could live the way they wanted to. 
After Bonwit Teller went out of business in 1990, Joe and Mickey began looking for their next adventure. Anyway, I, I had, uh, was interested in owning and operating a country inn, so we took a course in owning and operating a country yeah. inn, so and we went up to Vermont. There was a guy named Bill Oates and his wife who taught a course, a weekend course in owning and operating a country inn. In Cambridge, Joe and Mickey had come to know Monsef and Donna Medeb. Monsef was a hugely influential chef and restaurateur, founder of one of the top restaurants in Boston, Les Balliers. Monsef and Donna owned a country home in Charlottesville, Virginia, and they convinced Mickey and Joe to come down there and look for an inn and restaurant to acquire. When we took the course in owning and operating a country inn, they said, you know, every inn is for sale. You so just go in and ask. So we literally, the Silver Thatch Inn, we walked into the Silver Thatch Inn, and the inn was for sale. The couple was getting a divorce. Two of the hazards of owning an inn are alcoholism and divorce. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So we bought the inn. <laughs> Joe and Mickey ran the Silver Thatch Inn successfully for several years before deciding to sell it. It was hard work with barely any days off, but they enjoyed it and avoided many of the personal pitfalls of running an inn. And recently, they were reminded of just what they had accomplished. We recently, we were at a, uh, our granddaughter, um, Cece, had a birthday party. And one of the mothers is there, and I don't know, we started talking to her, and we talked about UVA, and that we had lived in Charlottesville. She said, oh my God, I loved it, loved UVA. My sister went there. She said, you know, maybe you guys might remember, there was an inn in Charlottesville, a restaurant, and it was a white building and my sister and I, whenever parents came down, we always wanted to eat there. And so I said to them, was it the Clifton Inn? And she said, no. Mickey says to her, would it have been the Silver Thatch Inn? She said, yes. <laughs> she had been there when we owned the inn. That's she funny. said, I remember my mother for graduation said, would put on her calendar when graduation was and a year in advance, called the inn to get a table. 